Hi, welcome to The Good Fight on Blogging Heads, uh, where we bring people who disagree together and see if we can find some common ground. I'm Arya Cohen-Wade, uh, Managing Editor of Blogging Heads. Uh, Blogging Heads viewers will surely recognize our two guests today. Uh, they almost don't need an introduction, but I'll give them one anyway. Uh, Sarah Posner of Religion Dispatches and The Posner Show on Blogging Heads, and Michael Brendan Doherty of The Week, The Score, and The Slurve. Uh, so today yep. we're, we're going to uh, thank you both for for coming on. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, the contraception mandate and issues of religious freedom arising from it. Um, so I thought we could start off with Sarah just kind of giving a, a brief summary for viewers who are unaware of this issue of kind of you know what's happened in the past couple of years and, and where we are now. So after the Affordable Care Act passed, um, HHS, the Department of Health and Human Services promulgated a regulation requiring uh, employers who provide their employees with health, ins health insurance that the insurance cover 20 different types of birth control, uh, including emergency birth control. Um, in that regulation, the Obama administration exempted churches and other houses of worship from having to comply with it. And after um, pushback from religious leaders and churches who felt that other religious institutions that weren't churches, such as religious hospitals, religious universities, and other religious nonprofits, um, they pushed for those organizations to be exempt as well. What the Obama administration did uh, as way of compromise was craft what they called an accommodation that basically uh, kicked the responsibility of ensuring that this coverage was provided to the insurance carrier or the, in the case of self-insured organizations, um, the uh, third party administrator so that these religious organizations, if they did not want to, um, that they could basically ha not be involved in the providing of the coverage. Um, then, we saw a slew of lawsuits. I've sort of lost track of the total number. It might be somewhere around 40 or 50. Some of these lawsuits were brought by for-profit companies um, who had no exemption and no accommodation at all, um, saying that the complying with this regulation violated their religious freedom rights under the Free Exercise Clause and the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Uh, those cases have been making their way through the courts, and the Supreme Court uh, accepted two of them, Hobby Lobby and Conestoga Wood, uh, and we'll hear arguments in those cases at the end of March. Uh, at the same time, there's been a slew of the cases brought by the nonprofit organizations that were entitled to the uh, accommodation rather than the exemption. Those two are making their way through the courts. Uh, the most prominent one, which will in all likelihood, be the one that decides the whole matter is uh, the University of Notre Dame, which will be heard by the Seventh Circuit imminently. And there was another case that was had a legal issue that was a little wrinkle in all of this, um, the Little Sisters of the Poor, um, which is an order of nuns that uh, runs a, a system of nursing homes. Um, the Supreme Court kicked that case back to the Court of Appeals. And so, again, those cases are making their way through the Court of Appeals. The first cases to be decided by the Supreme Court will be the for-profit company cases. Um, Michael, does that, you know, are you in agreement on all the facts? <laughs> Sarah? Yeah, we're, we're, in, we're in agreement. That was a very lucid, careful, and uh, clear explanation of how we got here. Okay, so I guess, so, you, you know, uh, just starting it off, uh, you know, is it wrong for the government to mandate uh, contraception coverage? Um, hmm. It's kind of a broad question. So, uh, you know, my first response is for it to mandate who to provide the contraception, contraceptive coverage. Um, you know, my first response is no, uh, the government shouldn't be mandating this of anyone. Uh, but that gets to like a broader rejection on my part as a conservative of uh, two things. One, I don't think contraceptives are normally um, the type of medical service, if you want to call them that, that should fall under an insurance policy, right? Uh, I tend to think of insurance, 
as being very useful for catastrophic events. Um, whereas I think of contraceptive coverage for, in most cases, as a sort of normal cost um, that consumer, healthcare consumers should bear. Um, now I can't get my way on that, um, of course. So on the second order, I would say that um, I, I actually wouldn't even address it that way. I would say that for Catholics like myself um, to assist people in to directly and explicitly assist people in doing something that we regard as sinful is to help them to sin and to help us to sin. And that kind of drives the, the religious liberty argument about ensuring contraceptives. So, um, yeah, I would say the government was wrong to mandate this from an actuarial standpoint and from a, a moral standpoint. Uh, I do think it's an infringement on religious liberty. And in, in a larger sense, I, I think it's ridiculous that we're doing health care through employers because of a New Deal era tax code loophole. Um, I just don't, I, I, I think it, it was inevitably going to result in, in these kind of clashes of interest um, and exposure of privacy, uh, whether the, the employer's religious beliefs or an employee's, you know, medical needs. So I, I guess that's as a, a broad ranging way of describing where I'm coming from on this. Well, let's stick with the religious liberty issues and not complicate it with questions of, um, sure. you know, whether the, gov the government should be mandating an employer provided health insurance. Let's just accept that that's what's in the Affordable Care Act, that the Supreme Court has held that. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess they haven't. They ruled on the individual mandate. But in any case, so um, sticking with the religious liberty issue. So the, the legal issue that the Supreme Court is going to decide in the Hobby Lobby case, which incidentally, which I forgot to mention in the opening there, um, both those cases, those for-profit company cases that reached the Supreme Court um, involve evangelical business owners as opposed to Catholic business owners. Yeah. So these particular owners do not believe that all contraception is sinful. Um, they have singled out a handful of the 20 methods that they say um, are abortifacients, which is a contested uh, yeah. statement. But I'll get to that in a minute. So back to the question that REA posed. Um, so the question that, that the Supreme Court is going to address is whether um, the business owners, uh, religious exercise is substantially burdened um, by this. And it, it, the government, even if there is a substantial burden, the government, if the government shows that it has a compelling interest in having this regulation, in other words, in having contraception covered um, without a copay, um, and that this is the least restrictive, meaning least restrictive on religious liberty concerns, means of the government uh, have, uh, imposing this regulation. Um, so it's not just a question, uh, there's sort of a legal standard that these companies are going to have to show. And the question of what constitutes a substantial burden is really at the heart of that. And what the government is arguing in the Hobby Lobby case is that it's really too attenuated, uh, from right. making the owners of Hobby Lobby or Conestoga Wood actually do anything that's in violation of their religious beliefs. The government concedes that, uh, hot, they have a sincerely held religious belief. They concede that the religious belief compels them to not want to use or even cause somebody else to use, um, uh, uh, Ella, Plan B, and certain IUDs. Although I guess it's a little vague as to whether there's other uh, other contraceptions, uh, contraceptive methods involved there. But in any case, what the government is saying is, you know, look, you're just directing your insurance carrier to provide this coverage. That's it. You're not requiring anybody to use it. It's not that much different from you pay your employees a wage, and they might go out and buy the contraception with it. So, um, you know, the question is not whether, uh, 
the government and the court is not going to question the sincerity of their of this religious belief or you know the government hasn't conceded that the burden is substantial but it has conceded that this is a sincerely held religious belief but the law doesn't require that every religious belief be constitutionally protected when there are other people involved meaning the employees and when the action that's required is really attenuated from you actually participating in the sinful activity. Right. Right. And as I said, I mean, listen, there are, there's even debate among, you know, Catholic right. ethicists about exactly how attenuated this is, whether this, this amounts to material um, cooperation, cooperation right. with it, material cooperation, remote material cooperation, or indirect remote material cooperation. You know, there's all these technical terms derived from uh, Thomistic philosophy that are being deployed. Um, you know, my case for the objectors would be that it's not that attenuated, right? That, that this is a, this is a form of cooperation especially when it's laid out in a kind of explicit what plan you are choosing for your employees and what's included in it, whether that's, you know, directly spelled out or kind of suppressed in some way where then like the text is almost suppressed, which has been one uh, option that seems to have somewhat been floated out there. I, what what do you, possibility what's, what's being suppressed? This. I guess I didn't really understand that. Well, uh, well, the, um, the question of originally when the accommodation came out, there was talk of, okay, this will be covered by the third party or by the insurance company, but somehow the employer isn't really paying for it. And I don't understand, I actually still don't understand the mechanism by which insurance companies generously give benefits that they, that require magically don't require because payment. it's cheaper um, it's cheaper for them to cover someone's contraception than to cover childbirth i mean for them it's just on a purely right. economic standpoint from a financial standpoint it turns out it's much cheaper um even i think with the more expensive methods of birth control because you know i mean childbirth um, and then covering the child. Uh, I mean, not to sound cold about it. I mean, um, but oh, but that's what it amounts. It's uh, that's what right. it amounts to. But um, but I guess so. There's two different questions here. So you brought up the the accommodation for the religious nonprofits, which actually raises different, right. I think, different issues about the level of cooperation than the um, than the for profit companies, because the for profit companies raise a whole host of other issues like do uh, corporations have a religious conscience that can be substantially burdened or infringed upon by government action and, and where does that stop when they enter into uh, commercial activity uh, you know where do you draw the line of the things that they, they could potentially object to especially when it impacts their employees and perhaps impacts their employees um, religious conscience. I mean, they might have employees whose religious conscience says that they should use uh, emergency birth control uh, rather than uh, have an unintended pregnancy. So, you know, these are issues that are, that, that's what's there. But then as far as the accommodation, that raises issues of, well, if you are going to, you know, sign this form that the government has you sign saying, uh, I object to playing a hand at all in providing this ins uh, insurance coverage for contraception. This is the issue in Notre Dame and Little Sisters, right? Um, and so yep. there's that form, and then the form goes to the insurance carrier or to the third-party administrator um, in the case of self-insured entities like Little Sisters of the Poor. Um, so the question is there, you know, does filling out that form and basically washing your hands of it and handing it off to the insurance company is that really involving you in a way that um, constitutes a substantial burden on your religious exercise? Yeah, it's a, and that's a, it's a tricky question because the I don't know if I agree with the Little Sisters case, but I I understand it. Um, can you know, can we can we explicate the Little Sisters case um, a little bit more uh, for viewers who are unaware of it? So. It's a religious order that runs a um, 
nursing nursing home, and they they are, as I understand it, they are exempt from the coverage. They're not they exempt. Need to so fill. They're they're in, because they're not a church. They're entitled to the accommodation. So the accommodation means that they have to fill out this form that I was just talking about. Um, and, and their objection is filling out the form. In in some sense, does create um, has a ripple effect that would lead to. Um, contraception coverage being provided in a yes, ex- even more attenuated except way. Except that uh, in the Little Sisters case, as opposed to Notre Dame or some of the other uh, religious nonprofits that have sued, in the Little Sisters case in particular, and there's I think maybe half a dozen other cases that are in this same situation, the insurance carrier that they use is exempt from the Affordable Care Act. So it is exempt from regulation under... Um, the employee benefit statute and also under the Affordable Care Act. So in any case, Be, them, because they use a, 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 a religiously based, it's called a church insur- plan, insurance right? Company. Right. It's called a church plan. So they're exempt yeah. from the contraception co- mandate. So basically little sisters would fill out this form and it would be of no effect because the insurance carrier receives notice that little sisters does not want to provide the coverage and they say, hey, you know, well, we're not going to provide it anyway because we don't have to. The government doesn't even require us to. Right. Right. Although the sisters make a case that, you know, they don't want to be depending on a regulation of another entity that could change in the future and that the second page of this form that they have to sign you know, basically is a declarement that the form itself is an instrument that can trigger a third party administrator to provide the coverage, right? So it's sort of like they say, they're essentially arguing that even though it doesn't require contraception to actually be covered, in a way it's requiring us to, you know, assent that it be covered, which in itself is a violation of our conscience. Do you buy that argument? Which, um, I do think that the form could be worded in a way that you know, if you're really trying to thread the needle, you could just, you know, thread the needle on this um, and not, and eliminate that language, I think. Um, but I, so I don't know. For me, that's that's slicing the salami very thin in a way that, uh, you know, the, the sort of like, there's not going to be anything provided. But I, I understand the hesitance to sign it. Right. I mean, that's the the essence of a lot of religious beliefs ends up being that holding on to them requires you to be really persnickety about exactly what you're about, what you're doing. Right. I mean, when, the you know, this is I'm not comparing these as far as gravity, but when the Romans would encourage Christians to throw smoke at an idol of the emperor, they never actually said you have to believe this. They just said, just throw the smoke, just do it. To show you're being obedient and then you know a lot of people said well we can't do that even if you're saying oh you don't have to think this way you don't have to really believe it you know the, the nature of religious objections is to be really cussed about uh objecting um so since since uh, on the good fight our task is to find some common ground would you both agree that uh, some sort of accommodation for the little sisters case can be worked out uh, to satisfy both sides, or do you think that this is kind of intractable at this point? Well, I'm just not, I'm just not sure that the little sisters are, I, I can't predict what they'll do, what they would accept. Well, I mean, they right? will have to accept, to or presumably will have to accept whatever the courts decide. I mean, they, they decided to litigate this and the courts might rule that they do have to fill out the form or not that they have to fill out the form. That's obviously their choice or, um, or suffer the consequences. But the, the thing that I don't get, I have to say about the whole little sisters scenario is this. So the government knows that the little sisters form is basically stating the little sisters objection to um, a, a objection to providing the coverage. But then what it triggers is nothing, right? It doesn't trigger anything because the church plan that ensures their employees doesn't have to comply with the mandate. So I don't get, like, so if the court says, well, filling out the form doesn't violate your sincerely held religious beliefs, it's not a substantial burden, 
And so then, then what happens? So the little sisters decide to just defy it and not fill out the form. Is the government really going to impose a fine or a tax on them when it's not, it's of no effect anyway, that, that their insurance carrier is not going to provide the coverage, doesn't have to provide the coverage in any event. It just seems like a ridiculous. That's a, that's a very interesting way of flipping the, the, the sort of technicalities of the case the other way around. Right. Is that like, at the same time, is the, you're exactly right. Is it seems so trifling? Uh, uh, this form seems so trifling, on one way for the sisters to sign, but then on the other hand, it seems really trifling if they don't sign it to kind of, you know, nail them with all the the pen, potential penalties. Right, because I mean, if they, the government, it, it was HHS, happen. the defendant in the case, that wrote into the regulation that church plans like the Christian Brothers Services are exempt so that's what i don't i think that there was like a situation right like one hand not knowing what the other one was doing because now this case is in litigation the denial of the preliminary injunction went all the way to the supreme court and it's it, like when you break it down it seems kind of silly yeah do you think um sarah that the um do you do you think that non-profit uh, organizations that aren't churches or for-profit enterprises like Hobby Lobby should be able to uh, swerve around these reg regulations because of the, you know, either their religious affiliation in the case of the non-profits or the, you know, just the stated beliefs of the owners in the case of Hobby Lobby. I'm guessing you, you, you don't. No, because I think that I think that RIFRA is a very expansive statute that very religiously <laughs> guards the free exercise rights of American citizens. It's very protective, but I don't think that it was intended to protect this sort of thing. I mean, I know that there's this whole debate about RIFRA and you know the reasons it was it was enacted. Um, was because of the Supreme Court case, um, you know, Employment Division versus Smith, where people on both sides of the aisle, the left and the right, they were very concerned that that holding would result in inadequate protection of people's religious liberty rights, right? And so that's why we have RIFRA. But RIFRA is not that expansive that ensuring, you know, providing insurance coverage for a thing that you disagree with um, constitutes a substantial burden. I just have a really hard time seeing how that is a substantial burden. And I, it's not because I think that religious liberty claims are frivolous, not at all. Um, but I think that these also have to be looked at from the standpoint of the religious liberty rights of the employees, because especially when you're dealing with this particular situation where the employer is being asked to do something, um, it tilts the balance in favor of the employer being able to refuse to do certain things that might be a the government it might constitute the government putting a imprimatur on a certain religious belief by giving them an exemption or if functionally an exemption um, and then also flip the balance against the religious liberty rights of the employees so um, so, you know, it's not that I'm hostile to religious liberty claims. I just think that this particular one is not the sort of thing that was contemplated by RIFRA. And that's even setting aside the questions of are corporations covered by RIFRA. And we, we, if we haven't stated already, RIFRA is the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, I, I believe. Yes. Um, yep. Sarah, what, so what organizations do you think should be exempt from the contraceptive contraception mandate well i mean i you know i i guess there is legally speaking you know pr precedents for houses of worship to be exempt from requirements that are made of other types of nonprofits as well as um for-profit companies so that exemption was already written into the regulation that the houses of worship if they chose not to i mean obviously you know Catholic churches are not going to cover it, but there are religious entities that will. Yeah. Um, 
uh, but they don't have to if they don't want to. And that's already written into the regulation. And I think that that was an adequate protection of religious liberty. And so why would you not extend that to a Catholic hospital or university? Well, they have entered into um, a commercial engagement with uh, non-co-religionists in a way that churches don't. See, that's, inter that's interesting, right, to me. I, I, I wonder, uh, you know, I join with, uh, I guess, a parade of conservatives that worry that this is a way of defining religious liberty uh, in such a way as to lock it behind a church door. That, like, suddenly, like, I'm not a Catholic when I'm employing people or when I'm running a soup kitchen or when I'm, you know, doing all these other things that I'm doing because you know, I think I have a religious obligation to do them. Um, I think... So it, it, it's, an, it's just an interest... Anyway, go ahead. Well, I, I, th I think that you can simultaneously acknowledge that somebody is exercising their religious practice and their religious freedom in every facet of their life, whether they're at church or they're at work. The question is, does the law entitle you to exemptions from... Um, generally applicable laws when you're not at, in the church setting. And so those are the questions that are raised, not whether you know people think that or I think that uh, you need to leave your religion at home and at church. It's perfectly understandable that, you know, when you're um, at your job, you bring your religious beliefs with you, but um, that doesn't mean that the government has to accommodate those religious beliefs in every facet of the way the government regulates commercial behavior, um, particularly when there are other people's interests involved. So one thing that's interesting is um, this debate ends up bringing up a lot of hypotheticals, right? People's because people are trying to find, I think, grope towards limiting principles. In this, so they say, like, okay, well, if we grant Hobby Lobby's case um, that this infringes on their religious liberty, what about, you know, is there no end to the amount of claims that employers could make when they don't want to cover something, right? Like, you could make up a religion that says, I, I don't believe in Western medicine at all, um, <laughs> and don't want to cover it. I don't think you'd have to make, you, you wouldn't have to make up that religion. Yes. <laughs> right. You wouldn't. Right. Uh, but, th but then on the other side, there are other hypotheticals on the other side. Well, what if in 15 years, HHS says, okay, um, we already have reproductive care in covered in this contraceptive mandate. We need to expand it to abortion, to um, sterilization. I mean, there are some, there's some sterilizing elements in some of the mandate here. Sterilization... Um, sex reassignment surgery, you know, there could be any number of other things that I think people uh, already try to make room for religious believers to object to and to find ways not to participate in. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, would you object if, if the HHS expanded to ab abortion, right? So, okay, it's the little sisters, you've got to sign this form, um, and or some other Catholic hospital, Notre Dame, you have to provide all of your teachers with uh, coverage for copay free abortion. I mean, would would you object to that? Or I'm wondering if there's a limiting principle on the other side. Well, the the decision to use the contraception coverage is the employee's decision, right? So just mm -hmm. like the employee could take the wages that Notre Dame or the Little Sisters pay them and pay for an abortion out of pocket. I mean, so it's to me, it's sort of like, well, you know, you can't control everything that your employees do, even if it offends you and offends your religious sensibilities. I mean, I get that it does offend your religious sensibilities, but at some point the employee gets to make their own decision about what they do with their insurance coverage and what they do with the wages that you pay them. 
so I guess it's not, to me, that's not a thing that worries me about infringement on religious beliefs. Now, if the government, now this obviously won't happen, but I mean, if the government said, um, you know, you have to help your, uh, you know, you have to, if your employee finds herself pregnant and she wants to have an abortion, you have to help her find a doctor who will perform the abortion. I mean, that, okay, I, that would be problematic. But once you start, you know, providing benefits and, and wages to your employee, I just don't think how, you, how can you control what they do with that? See, I don't worry. See, it's funny how we think about where the moral culpability comes in. Because my, my view would be, my moral reasoning would be, if I provide wages, I'm providing wages for the work done, right? So there's a, uh, I'm justly providing wages and compensating. Mm -hmm. Then what the employee does with the wages is their, their moral responsibility, right? So like, uh, you know, I have a little side company of my own. If I hired someone and I paid the money, you know, I'm not going to try to make them sign a contract that they'll never use things that I object to with the money I pay them. Because to me, once I've paid them, I've paid them for the work, that was the end of my respon of my moral responsibility. But aren't your insurance benefits to, part to oversee of that? that? Part of that compensation? That's where the argument that's where the argument comes in. That's where I would say the moral culpability is more like this. It's legal for me to loan my brother, if I had one, a car, if I presume he's using it for a legitimate purpose, mm -hmm. right? It's totally fine. Even if he goes on to commit a crime with it, right? I didn't, didn't know. But if I'm, if I have a discussion with him, or I sign some sort of agreement that this is a getaway car for a crime, then I'm legally responsible. And similarly, I would argue before God, I am responsible if I'm signing this contract saying, okay, this is part of my just compensation to you. And further, I mean, I would even go so far, because I'm a Catholic, I don't think using artificial birth control is really even properly medicinal in the sense of, in most cases, as birth control, because I don't think of fertility as a sickness or malady. But I would say, I'm. this is something I'm, you're asking me to give my employee and I think it's harming them. Um, you know, I think I think it constitutes a moral harm. But to them they, what if they don't do this? Right, they don't think that. I yeah. understand, but that's why I would say that's why that's why I would like to untangle insurance questions from employment. You know, more regularly, just as I wouldn't want, um, you know, say employers had to give out um, had to contract with food suppliers directly, right? I wouldn't want that because I don't, if I end up working for a vegan who thinks that meat is murder, I don't want to have to call in the government to tell them like, no, you've got to contract directly with this slaughterhouse because, you know, these people have a right to their protein. Is like, veganism a religion? It, <laughs> I don't, th I don't think it is, but I do think that a person would have a legitimate um, I, I do think the objection to providing, to contracting directly with a slaughterhouse is a real, is a real moral objection is a real, and can be a real principled one. I don't think it's religious in nature, but that's why I think money provides this nice medium of separating responsibility in the market process. And why I, I think of employer provided insurance as a kind of like a tenancy wage, you know, it's sort of like, um, I, I understand that this is like a common benefit, but it's, it's partly a common benefit because of a, a quirk of our tax code. Um, so I, I just, I wish to free, if you're going to have a society that's pluralistic, it's very difficult that, and pluralistic conceptions of the good, of rights, it's very hard then to create these enforcement mechanisms for enforcing rights that are so intimate, right? That that do involve people like this. Um, so I, I, I guess just, I don't I think that's I don't the tension. consider it that intimate, particularly because I mean the insurance 
is a method of, uh, you know, cost shifting, basically, um, or cost covering, um, you know, or you pay in to the insurance and, you know, you pay your premiums and then the benefits are there for you because you paid your pre premiums. Um, so I don't consider that like an intimate rela relationship or arrangement. And I don't think that the arrangement between the employer and the insurer is an intimate one. What is the intimate relationship is, or the intimate arrangement is between the patient and her doctor. Um, and right. so, and that's a relationship that the employer shouldn't really interfere with or have a say in, regardless of their but religious they, beliefs. And but so, they do. for example, uh, you know, in the Hobby Lobby case, I mean, I think the, um, you know, the, the case for the substantial burden might be like a little bit um, stronger for the Catholic entities because they do have this written doctrine against the use of contraception, right? Yeah. Um, but with the, um, the non-Catholic objectors, it's sort of like, well, you know, I just, I don't like the IUD and I don't like, um, you know, uh, Ella or Plan B, and I think that they cause abortions, even though, you know, the medical community disagrees with that. Um, so I guess it's, I mean, I think if you yeah. go and you work at a church, right, if you go work at the diocese, right, as a secretary or a teacher or what have you, I mean, you have some, you know, understanding that this is what they're belief system is and this is what the doctrine says right. right but if you go work as a cashier at Hobby Lobby I think you have a much lesser expectation a because it's a private company as opposed to a religious organization but b because it's like well how are you going to have any you know knowledge that this is this is their objection to you know you know what I'm saying it's like it seems like people could just start right. no, 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 I... to all sorts of things um it, I, and, I, I agree. There's like an illegibility held belief. I, the only reason I'm saying it's stronger for the Catholic objectors is because, you know, it is quite obvious that that is their belief. But what's interesting is um, we do have employers making health care decisions based on reasons that I think we would agree are much less grave than their religious beliefs. We have them making decisions based on what to cover, based on just fiduciary, uh, their fiduciary calculations and how much profit they want to take out of a company. A, a company can say, hey, I'm not offering medical care. I'm not offering, uh, you know, it's not required that you offer uh, medication to treat asthma currently in every single plan. And those are intimate things. And we just, it, it's interesting that they don't, this doesn't come under the same kind of moral opprobrium that having a religious objection comes under well, for um, objecting to contraceptive But, but you're coverage. saying that those decisions not to cover certain things are financial decisions, like it might be too expensive to cover certain kinds of cancers or what have you. I'm just throwing out a hypothetical there um, okay. because of the costs of the care. Uh, but the consideration with the uh, contraception coverage is purely the religious objection because it's a right. fact that it's cheaper we talked about this before it's cheaper to cover contraception you know if you're looking at it from a purely economic standpoint it's cheaper to cover contraception than it is to cover a pregnancy a childbirth and a child oh no i agree and it, listen some of the 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 objectors uh, have said we're, we'd happily pay more right we, we'd happily if it costs more to cover to not cover contraception will happily pay more because you know that's what we believe is healthcare. Um, but I, I just mean the the kind of uh, I'm talking about the kind of rhetorical valence of things is we already let employers make intimate decisions about what is paid for and what isn't based on just the bottom line, right? That's already the case. And it's a case that everyone accepts without batting an eye. Well, I don't. I don't. I, don't, um, I guess I don't consider that intimate. Well, well, then what is? I, then I don't understand the definition. If if I can't get my asthma medic medication from my insurance company because it costs extra for my employer to cover that, 
Your employer, your employer less... is an asshole. Okay, so like we'll both agree to that, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe, but that's the thing is that we'd actually. It doesn't seem like we agree to that. I mean, there are there are, there are things that are still um, where the cost is still expected to fall onto. Um, there's expected to be a copay somewhere. Well, I so um, I guess you know what if HHS uh, promulgated a regulation based on you know medical studies and so on that every employer who's providing employer-based coverage under the Affordable Care Act has to cover um, asthma medication. Just a, from a public right. health standpoint, you know, everybody needs their asthma medication free of copay. So, I'm, I, I mean, would I you object to that? I mean, I have, I have no, I have no objection to that on, a, on religious grounds. Um, I would, I would be curious as to, you know, what this actually does to the cost of, um, of asthma medication generally, right? It makes it cheaper, air quotes, cheaper for the consumer, um, for the, the end user to have their asthma medication, but does it actually keep costs down at all? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Um, absent, you know, I guess one of the things that's kind of underlying this for me is, um, like I said at the beginning, that I think that there's financial reasons why contraception shouldn't be uh, covered by insurance. You know, I, I would even be, I would happily take the compromise of making it available over the counter um, and making it a mo much more competitive thing um, in the marketplace. But yeah, well, um, I, let's just stop there for a second because we, I think we may have identified an area of common ground. Uh, Sarah, I mean, what do you, would you agree that we would maybe all be better off if more forms of contraception were available without prescription? Um, well, I guess, you know, if you're going to get birth control pills or a diaphragm or an IUD, you have to see your doctor for that. Like you have to be sure you're, I mean, it's not something that you can just go into the drugstore and get. And I have to say, I am not an expert on like costs and cost shifting and the economics of insurance. So, um, mm -hmm. but purely from a medical standpoint, I don't know that providing, I mean, I know that certain contraception is provided, including hormonal contraception is provided, oh, it can be provided over the counter, but I don't know that all of it across the board can, whether it's medically feasible to do that. And, and in truth, actually, I, I would wonder, too, if there were some contraceptives that would be inadvisable for medical reasons for people to, you know, use without some kind of consultation. Right. Um, but the, what's interesting in our system is, unlike in some European systems, um, pharmacists can't actually provide any consultation on the use of, of the medicines that they dispense in the way that they can in some other countries. Um, so it, I, there, there are some weird quirks about the American system in, in that way that I think touch on this um, that we're not going to resolve right now either. <laughs> I don't think so. Try again, Arye. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, we, I, I'm, I'm, I'm grasping at straws on what you two actually maybe agree with. Is there anything that uh, you would volunteer from this conversation that you think is some, uh, some areas of agreement? Well, I think that we both agree that um, it's important for the government and the courts to um, be mindful of people's religious exercise and take steps to ensure that it's not infringed upon. Yeah, I, th I think that's an area of agreement. I also think we probably agree, and this, this may sound like thin gruel, but I think we agree, um, you know, I think in a pluralistic society, we agree that there should be access to contraception, right? Like, I'm not going to take the full um, 15th century <laughs> position that all contraception is witchcraft um, and it should be banned. Um, even though it is, <laughs> um, just kidding, but, uh, that it should be available to those who, um, sincerely want it. Um, and that it should be, uh, not just available, but accessible, right? I think, 
I think one of the true aims of the Obamacare contraception mandate is to make this uh, as accessible as possible because there's the beliefs of the administration, I think, that undergird that are that unintended pregnancy is wrong, we've got to rem or is, is bad, it has all these harms for the children, for the parents, um, and that we should work to prevent that and take any obstacles out of the way of preventing that. Um, and, I, you know, I don't think I'd have as an, an emergency or urgent view about that as they do, but I think in general, yes, um, people should have access to, to the ability to control their fertility. I just don't think that insurance through employers is necessarily the best way to do it. So that's what we're, that's the disagreement. <laughs> at the end. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't confess to this, to the best way to, to ensure that people get access to it and have, have it available to them at, at minimal or no cost. I mean, I don't, I, I, I don't know enough about the economics of that. I mean, obviously, <laughs> I mean, um, you know, I don't think it's a huge uh, 21st century concession to say <laughs> that, uh, you know, everyone should have access to birth control. I mean, that seems pretty evident. But I no, I, 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 under I understand. I'm, I'm a, on the, of the 2% of Catholics who don't use, con uh, who actually follow right, this I teaching, know. I'm, probab I'm probably within a 2% of them um, in, in how tough I am about it. But, uh. Right, but I mean, I guess I guess but, here's the thing. I mean, the wonderful thing is that you live in the United States of America, and you have this minority religious belief. I mean, it's a minority belief even within your own yeah. faith, even though you know that's the official teaching of your faith, right? More yep. of your co-religionists yeah. disregard it than than follow it. Um, but, yep. but your religious practice is, is protected and then everybody else who wants to, um, wants to access the copay free birth control covered by their insurance can also do that, even though you believe it would be, otherwise. It would be pretty crazy if the government somehow forbid, but like, that's, that's, you know, regulated but that's me into, the, into that's, not that's using some of the parade of horribles it, that conservatives are are laying out with regard to this, that it's this terrible infringement on religious liberty and so on and so forth. Well, I think, like I said, I do think, uh, listen, I do think it is a moral harm to provide this um, insurance if I were the employer. However, um, I do think a lot of conservative anxiety about this is general anxiety about what does the future mean after we've really lost the culture war and all the legal battles and all the um, cultural battles kind of cash out in the next 20, 30, 40 but years. But are conservatives you know, losing will it the mean... culture war? I mean, I think that they have a lot of anxiety about same-sex marriage, justifiably, yeah. given lower court opinions post-Windsor, right? Post the DOMA decision of the right. Supreme Court. But we still don't know how the Supreme Court is going to decide on the constitutionality of same-sex marriage bans in the states. We still don't know that, right? So, but I right. think that conservatives having anxiety about that is understandable. However, to say that conservatives are losing the culture war on, say, abortion, that they're winning that war. Yeah, no, that's, they're, they're definitely winning the war about access to abortion. I don't know if they're CRA, winning. we agree on that. There you go. <laughs> we, 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 we agree on that. And, the, and also the, the incidence of abortion, right, is um, they're winning the war on that. But I wonder if um, my own view is that they can't actually win the war on abortion um, without a much larger and, and more futile campaign about family and the whole sexual revolution altogether. That, they would lose uh, that one. <laughs> I don't think... Yeah, I, well, I think it's just, it's been lost in a, in a way that um, I think there's still a lot to be cashed out in that um, going forward. But um, that's why I think that you know, 
the way the Supreme Court decides Hobby Lobby is going to be really important because that case involves an employer objecting to doing something for their employees on religious grounds, right? And so mm -hmm. here you have a for-profit company um, whose religious rights or the religious rights of the owners are being litigated. Now, when you, when you look at someplace like Kansas, where the legislature is considering uh, a bill that would provide basically a religious exemption for corporations or even government employees who don't want to serve a same-sex couple, um, you can see how the Supreme Court's ruling on the substantial burden question in Hobby Lobby could have much bigger consequences than just in this context of the contraception mandate. So, um, yeah. you know, I think that conservatives are rightly or, you know, justifiably anxious about the, the same-sex marriage stuff, yet they're, they seem to me to be trying to find all these different legislative ways or statutory ways of creating basically a little enclave for themselves that exempts them from, you know, providing insurance coverage for contraception or uh, serving same-sex couples or what have you. Um, and mm -hmm. like, I just, it's, it's, it's hard for me, like tactically speaking to understand like why, why they want, um, why they want to go in that direction, why they want to set themselves apart from and create this enclave for themselves where they can have a religious right to not do things that everybody else is doing. I, I well, that's the thing, right? I, I don't, I think because they anticipate that, um, in some cases, like say the case of a wedding photographer who doesn't want to do same sex marriages, they think their livelihood is going to be destroyed by lawsuits, right? Whereas, you know, if a photographer objected to doing uh, a wedding that was taking place at a church with a notoriously anti-gay minister, um, you know, no one, there wouldn't be really good standing or a lawsuit of some kind of discrimination, or I don't think. Well, you know, so the reason uh, why the photographer, say, in New Mexico got sued was New Mexico's anti-discrimination law for public accommodations prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, ethnicity, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, and sexual orientation. Um, so there's a law in place that protects the rights of uh, of people based on their sexual orientation from being discriminated against in public accommodations. Those, I mean, not all states have those laws. Kansas doesn't. So, you know, right. the baker or the photographer, the caterer in Kansas can already discriminate against the, um, against the uh, gay couple, except that, you know, they're, they're anticipating that they're going to be losing these battles. And so they want to carve out yes. a religious exemption in the case that that happens. And yeah, and I think they're anticipating they're going to lose these battles in the way that segregationists lost their battles, right? In a kind of, in a, in a, a way that routes them um, entirely. So yeah, they are, I think they are trying to, to carve out, a, I, I mean, I agree with you there, um, that they're trying to carve out like a spot for them, um, for themselves. But we'll, I mean, we'll see if they're successful. I, I, I don't, I don't imagine they will be um, in the, in the long term of, of thirty years, depending on, on what the Supreme Court rules soon. You know, I, I actually, um, even if the Supreme Court, um, you know, temporarily vindicates some of these attempts to, to create a kind of legal. I don't know, buffer zone around religious believers who object to um, whatever. Well, let me, um, let me flip it around. I, I don't, I'm not okay. sure it's going to last. So what about the argument that the protection of the religious exercise of the business owner, let's go back to the insurance coverage again. So we're talking about not the business owner and a potential customer, but the business owner and their own employees, right? And so mm -hmm. one of the concerns there is that the government, that the, that the business owner would be in effect um, imposing 
their religious beliefs on their employees, right? So like if they didn't have to cover the contraception, then they're basically imposing their opposition to a contraception on their employees who will then have to pay more than everybody else for contraception that their religious conscience says is not only perfectly fine to use, but is um, necessary to use because their religious conscience tells them that they want to um, uh, yeah. space their children a certain number of years apart or how, whatever the, whatever the concern is. Right. So, I mean, don't you think, I mean, don't you feel as a religious believer and an employee of somebody <laughs> that, you know, you, yeah. as the employee that you want your religious rights taken into account in these situations? I mean, I suppose, I, I don't think it works that way in the sense of, I do think you kind of should pay your own way. But that's like, your... that's the different issue. I mean, that's like the separate issue of like how you feel about the, it, the mandate, the government mandated insurance period. Right. Right. No, no. But I understand it. But at the same time, right. Like I have a, a right to give uh, the wages, my employer. So say the week, um, the owner hates the Catholic church or something like that, but I'm donating, you know, money every week in my envelope uh, at church. But it would be, I think it would be weird of me to ask my employer to take like a certain percentage of the money that would compensate me and send it directly to the Catholic Church on my behalf. Like I, I just think that, that 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 starts entangling people with each other in a way that does kind of create these conflicts of, well, whose rights, whose religious rights are being violated here? I think it's just very easy to beat up on, maybe it's not easy to beat up on the little sisters of the poor because, I mean, my God, they're naked little <laughs> sisters of the poor and they take they take care of dying people. But it's easier to beat up on, on Notre Dame because it's like, okay, here's a, a powerful, um, very well-endowed institution. Um, and then there's the employee who's much less powerful. And we don't take Notre Dame's religious objection all that seriously. I mean, most people, right? They just, I mean, most people think this is like some bizarre medievalism that's being, that somehow has survived into the modern age. Um, so, but if, if you take it to something else, like just plain money, where the money is going, um, I think people do start to understand that, that th whatever it is, this legal regime we've created is entangling people um, in a way that's, that's going to breed these conflicts. Um, right. But I, so I, I guess, I guess like, so you, a... you have to balance, you know, it's the, it's the employers that are raising the religious objection, but what about what I'm, all I'm saying is what about the employees? Why do the employees have to be subject to the religious objection of their employers to a generally applicable regulation? I mean, what if, you know, your employer, didn't want to cover, had a religious objection to covering, you know, antidepressants because they believe that, you know, depression and anxiety is a sign of demon possession. I mean, would that be okay? Right. No, no, I said that there's all, there's all sorts of hypotheticals, right? There's, and the hypotheticals work every which way. Like what if the government, like I said, you could make up any kind of, you know, what if the employer had a religious belief that like, you, gosh, I don't know, that everyone should be bald. <laughs> you know, like, there's a there's a million, uh, that all the employees should be bald because of a Well, I think the employees belief, there would have because... a clear, uh, you know, uh, lawsuit against the employer. <laughs> I don't right. think your or, employer or can or make you shave your head. Although, or Peter Angelus employer... made, for a while made all the Orioles not have facial hair, so... That's right. Or I just know, thought or maybe we something... could bring in a baseball analogy and we'd find some point of agreement. That would be good. That would be good. But it could be anything. It could be, you know, the employer says, I only want to employ white people because in my religion... That's against uh, the law. <laughs> right. Exactly. I, no, no, no. Exactly. But I mean, there's all of these... Um, I mean, we, already uh, we already decided can... that. Okay. So, so that's yeah. illegal. <laughs> No, 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 I agree, and I'm ha I'm fine with it being illegal. I'm just saying that we can make up all sorts of religion, hypothetical religions, and then we can also make up all sorts of hypothetical inclusions in employer-provided insurance that 
we recognize as objectionable. But what's interesting is the American, um, the American state and the American legal tradition has no, like, w vocabulary or way of distinguishing between, like, legitimate religions and illegitimate well, that's religions. that's because the or courts are religions. supposed to resolve theological disputes. Which is a good thing. I think it's a good thing that the courts don't have to resolve theological disputes, that they shouldn't resolve theological disputes, right? And well, that's, so that's, that's well, but, sort of embedded in RIFRA, right? So they're not going to decide whether the belief is sincerely held. They're just going to go, okay, that's, you put it in your court papers, that's your sincerely held belief. Done. Now the question is, does this regulation substantially burden it? And if it does, does the government have a compelling interest? And is this the least restrictive way of uh, accomplishing that compelling interest? So, um, you know, that's already that's already cooked into the whole equation that, you know, you have your religious belief and there it is. The courts are not going to question it, which is part of how religious exercise is protected, that the court is not going to adjudicate no. that. Oh, I agree. I agree. I'm I just think that it's an it's an interesting problem for the Amer the American system because I actually am not sure that a legal system with rights enforced in this way can handle a theoretical infinite number of religions, right? I mean, theoretically, yes. you could have 300 million different religions. I agree. I agree. I mean, I think that on the one hand, I'm very glad that the courts don't adjudicate theological disputes. That way, the courts are not going to adjudicate whether conservatives or liberals are right about whether the Bible says that same-sex marriage is wrong. Right. They're not going to decide right. it that way. The Constitution is going to decide that. But then, you know, like you said, people are going to come to the courts with these different claimed infringements of their religious beliefs, and the religious beliefs are potentially infinite. Um, but you know, the way the the jurisprudence is and the way RIFRA was written is, you know, basically the courts are going to address whether whatever the, the objected to thing is uh, substantially burdens that that religious belief. And so, uh, you know, I can imagine that there are religious beliefs that aren't going to be substantially burdened by generally applicable regulations um, and that the courts are going to, I mean, I don't, you know, whether I have confidence that this will come out in the right way, I'm not sure. But, you know, the courts are supposed to, you know, look at the way what the purpose of the regulation is and whether the government has a compelling interest in it and so forth. So I think that in the best, you know, you know, hopefully, you know, this will work out despite there being this panoply of religious beliefs. Um, and I guess that's the way it should work out that, you know, balance, balance these things in a way that um, protects people's religious exercise, but also protects other people from the, the government putting a, an imprimatur on somebody else's religious belief being imposed on you. It's, it's interesting. I wonder if we'll come out, you know, one possible escape route for the court is to say that um, this mandate isn't the least um, restrictive way of achieving this government goal. Um, and, you know, so perhaps, you know, not that the court would recommend it, but I mean, it might be that, okay, maybe, um, you know, the government should just provide contraceptives, copay free direct, you know, somehow directly. Um, well, sing uh, without, single payer, um, I'm all for it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that'll bring up other religious liberty conflicts eventually. <laughs> I'm sure, yes, if, yes. Uh, well, but, we're um, probably near the end of our time. I was just wondering if either of you would like to venture a prediction on how the, the Hobby Lobby case will uh, turn out at the Supreme Court. Gosh, I, I actually have no idea. You know, the, the, the little signs that we're getting um, and just the record of the court in the past decade on religious liberty issues is pretty expansive. It seems they have a pretty expansive view, not just the conservatives, but the, the liberals. Um, 
on the court as well. So, you know, I'm not sure. Um, in general, I don't. I don't think in 30 years, uh, a company like Hobby Lobby will be allowed to to make these objections and, and survive it. But for now, may, maybe, maybe they'll they'll be victorious. I have to say that I do think that taking into account both into account both the composition of the court and like Michael said, the expansive way um, they've looked at religious liberty and the expansive way that they've looked at how an entity determines what their religious liberty is. Uh, like for example, in the Hosanna Tabor case, they ruled unanimously that the that the religious entity gets to decide who is a minister and who isn't for purposes of um, exemption from uh, employment discrimination laws. So I do think that there's a chance that Hobby Lobby could win. However, I wonder, you know, there's so many sub issues in the case that don't really have a lot to do with um with the substantial burden question that have to do with, you know, corporation law and who are really the entities that are claiming, you know, the, is it the owners? Is it the, is it the directors? Is it, is it the company itself? That there are multitude of ways that the court could sort of avoid deciding the, the real question there. Um, but yeah. even if, yeah, okay. fully if, if but I just want to add, if Hobby Lobby wins, I think that the question of like, which of the, in, which of the insured, items that it doesn't want to cover is going to it'll still be that will still be up in the air okay i think that's a good place to end it uh thank you uh, both of you for this great discussion and uh thank you to our viewers and uh we'll see you all next time thanks all right thank you